some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. And from, from previously from being a cabinet member for environment and for the past three years being leader of the council, we have a record of achievement in Harrow of moving this agenda forward, the climate agenda forward. But what is heartening to me is bringing people together and making that change that we all seek. As you will see from the, from the agenda, we have some great speakers who are also passionate about our environment and driving this agenda forwards. And I will probably introduce them as we go through the webinar. As I've previously said, we cannot do this alone. We need to work together and we want to hear your questions, your views and ideas to meet the challenges ahead. I would urge you as we go through the meeting um, webinar to make use of the Q&A function on the site, not just to ask questions, but also to make comments. If, if you could preface with either a Q for a question or C for a comment, it would make it easier for the panel to respond later, later on. And during the presentation, we'll also be asking you questions and we'd like to hear your thoughts um, of what the issues that are being raised. If we succeed, then the rewards will be huge. Eight years to 2030 is not long, but as Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, who is um, Councillor Varsha Palmer, who is the Cabinet Member for Environment and Climate Change. <clears throat> so, Varsha. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Varsha Palmer, Cabinet Lead for Environment and Climate Change. As we all know, a very important conference took place in Glasgow where world leaders made commitments and agreements were signed, which is great. What is more important is not just signing agreements, but what actions will actually be taken. We all have a role to play in this. After all, in the end, it is about changing our behaviors and the way we live our lives. Anything we can do will be helpful, whether switching off lights, not charging all our techno gadgets at the same time, looking at our passion for online shopping, how much emissions do these vehicles pull out, put out? Just imagine if 10 million Londoners were to recycle one item a day for a year, we would have recycled 3.6 billion items in a year. And if we walked or cycled in the short distance when shopping and not take our cars, the difference that would make. We need to look at how we recycle, reuse and conserve in our daily lives and what actions we can all take to make that difference. In Harrow Council, we have made a good headway and Matthew will go through this in a moment. So I say to you, let's all of us work together collectively and collaboratively to heal our planet and to be the change and to make the difference for our future generations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Varsha. And I think that's a really good introduction to um, the webinar tonight, given a very good view about where we are coming from. Um, I'd, I'd ask like to introduce our second speaker, who is um, Dipti Patel. Um, Dipti recently joined Harrow Council as our Corporate Director for Environment and brings a lot of experience with uh, from other councils. And I think their loss is our gain in that sense that should drive this agenda forward. So um, to Dipti. Um, thank you, Graham, and um, good evening, everybody. I'm really, really pleased that we are um, in a webinar to talk about one of my passionate subjects around climate and climate emergency and what we are all going to do. Um, I'm really just going to put some thoughts and questions to you all. Um, and um, this is really just to get us to think about, you know, what you feel we need to do in Harrow um, as, as, as a focus, an area of focus. So, so the three questions I really have uh, and I want to highlight and there will be part of a, an opportunity for you to, to submit your thoughts and views is what is important to you when it comes to the climate and nature emergencies? So I think you know, that's the first question. Second one is how can we all help 
to get more people engaged in the borough on these issues? And thirdly, how would you like to be kept informed of this agenda? And I think for me, they are some critical questions that I'm sure will get the debate and thinking through of this session. Um, and following on from that, we are looking to put a poll up and to ask further questions in the future of how you would like us to, to deliver the webinars on particular topics moving forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy. Um, and as Deputy says, if you could um, also put your name in, in when you're um, asking the question and we know who it's coming from, but also we'll be able to feed back afterwards as well. We're now inviting, um, moving on to one, our first presentation. Um, when Harrow Council declared a climate emergency in 2019, uh, Matthew Adams stepped forward to be our head of natural resources and climate, a position that is used to really push the agenda around climate, not only in Harrow, but also on work across London. Matthew is here tonight to talk about the work we're doing in Harrow, what the next stages are and what we can all go together. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Councillor Henson, and uh, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm just going to um, uh, share my screen. Hopefully, you'll start to see my presentation in a moment um, coming up. Can I just check, uh, Councillor Henson, you can see that? Yes, thank you, Matthew. We can, yes. Great, okay. So, um, yes. This evening, just in the next 15 minutes, it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour because it's a, it's a big agenda, this, as you can imagine. Uh, I just wanted to set out um, a little bit of the background around the emissions in Harrow. So um, what emissions are we actually producing in Harrow and where, where are they coming from? And just to highlight some of the main things the council's been doing and hopefully leave you with a little bit of food for thought that we can build on later in the session on, on ways in which you can get involved as well. And uh, this is going to be very much a team effort as a... Um, the people introducing uh, the, the, the webinar have said um, it requires everybody in the borough to play their part and um, um, hopefully this is the start of a really productive uh, conversation across the borough. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, excuse me, about the data um, in, the, in the borough and we talk a lot about the tons of CO2, you probably heard it from COP as well from the COP26 conference. I just find this is helpful sometimes just to visualize what does that actually look like well this is a ton of co2 it's a, a sphere of gas 10 meters by 10 meters and um i find it helpful when i'm trying to conceptualize this just really to think about these little balloons that we're all holding whether it's us individually or as part of the organization or company where we work um, or as the borough or indeed as the nation uh, every year we are collectively producing and letting go of these balloons um, up into our atmosphere and as that first slide showed, our atmosphere really is, um, when you see it from space, it's a thin blue line and, and you can start to see how easy it is for us um, collectively to start to alter its composition and, and lead to, the, uh, to the, the, the extreme weather and the climate change that we're seeing. So there's an internationally agreed protocol for measuring um, emissions and uh, won't get too much of the detail, but broadly it falls into three categories and they're known as scope one, scope two and scope three. And um, the, the first category um, and the easiest one for us to understand is probably the direct emissions. So these are the emissions actually arising in our local area as a result of, of what we're all doing here. And broadly, for all intents and purposes, for most of London, it, it falls, that falls into two, two main areas. Uh, our heating, which uh, for most of us still comes from gas boilers, and uh, our transport, uh, our road transport in particular. So the fossil fuels were burning in all of the uh, vans, uh, cars, trucks and buses are on our roads. And when we look at the data, um, you can see uh, there that uh, nearly 60% of our direct emissions in Harrow uh, come from residential buildings, not surprising given, as I said, most of us have, have gas boilers, and just over a quarter comes from uh, road transport, and then smaller amounts from the business community and, and industrial uh, community, reflecting the fact that we don't have any very big businesses or manufacturing uh, in Harrow. And the total there at the bottom uh, left, you can see uh, about 450,000 tons, 450,000 of those balloons from direct emissions actually being produced locally uh, in our area uh, every year. 
So what's the council doing about it? Well, um, as one of the a big up service provider in Harrow, we have a big fleet of vehicles and um, we're fortunate in that we've replaced most of our vehicles um, relatively recently in the last couple of years. Uh, the vast majority are what's known as Euro 6 compliant, so the, the most efficient uh, pe petrol and diesel vehicles you can get. And we actually have 16 fully electric vans as well, from which some services like our, our Meals on Wheels service is delivered. Um, the reason we didn't go to uh, more electric vehicles at the time was that our really big vehicles, like the refuse trucks you'll see around the borough, um, the technology really wasn't available at any sort of cost um, uh, that would be value for money for the taxpayer. But things are changing very rapidly in this field, and um, uh, that technology is starting to come on stream now, and we're definitely going to be um, aware and taking advantage of opportunities over the coming years um, for further decarbonisation of, of our fleet. The other big area, of course, is our, our buildings. Um, we have lots of uh, uh, schools, uh, council buildings, and of course, council housing as well. And uh, this year, um, for the first time, we've, we've started a, a major decarbonisation programme on six of our school and council sites. Um, we applied for successfully 2.4 million from uh, the public sector decarbonisation scheme. And that's to install the sort of things you see in the bottom right of that photograph, um, large scale heat pumps for the first time. Uh, those are air source heat pumps, uh, which basically take the heat out of the, the air and uh, fire a refrigerant, act like a refrigerator in reverse and, and effectively replace the gas heating uh, with uh, a, an electrically um, operated heating system. And they're around three, sometimes four times more efficient than a gas boiler as well. Three of our um, sheltered housing blocks with old gas boilers are due to receive um, ground source heat pumps, a variation of, of that sort of heat pump, which this time uses boreholes in the ground to extract the heat. Uh, and uh, we're also doing work out in the borough as well. You can see that, that last uh, bullet point there, that's uh, um, uh, the Green Homes grant funding is, is funding that we've received and we're administering out in private homes in the borough, as well as a small number of our social housing stock. To do things like in the top right hand corner, that picture, external wall insulation. You can see those two uh, semi-detached houses have had external wall insulation added, and um, that can save up to about 45% of the of the energy um, uh, use of the building. And the Green Homes Grant Scheme, it's worth saying, uh, targets particularly those on low low income, so those on under £30,000 household income, and who those who live in the worst rated properties, E, F or G rated um, energy performing properties. And I'll, I'll post a link a little bit later so you can, you can uh, sit, find out more if you're interested about that. So the second main category of emissions is electricity. Um, fortunately, we don't see this site in the UK very much more these days. This is a, a coal-fired power station, but still around 40% of our electricity comes from uh, fossil fuels, um, mainly now gas turbines. So um, the energy that we use in Harrow um, has a, a carbon content to it and I won't dwell too long on this because of time but you can see again in the bottom left hand side around 200,000 tonnes a year of carbon associated with electricity use in Harrow and the majority again from from residential buildings. So one of the sort of uh, less uh, well-known uh, initiatives that we've done in the in the uh, council not very glamorous but a very important one is to replace our lighting stock we use a lot of electricity for street lighting and over the last few years we've invested nearly 20 million now in um, upgrading the street lights in harrow uh, to leds around 67 percent of, of the total lights you can see the difference on the right um, this is a street in harrow with the old sodium lights the or orangey glow in the top and then the uh, the led lighting is in the bottom picture it saves uh, a lot of carbon, as you can see, but also um, a lot of taxpayers' money. And uh, the interesting thing about these lights is you can dim them as well. And um, every night now, um, between uh, midnight and six in the morning, the lights are dimmed to about 66% of their capacity. And we've actually trialled 50% in quite a few residential areas without any, any obvious adverse effects. So there's the ability over time to, um, to further reduce our, our emissions as well. Uh, we've also had a, a quite extensive program of solar panels on schools. Um, 16 schools now have solar panels and those on the right are Pillar Park, uh, uh, high, sorry, a Park High School, uh, which some of you may know. And um, uh, just this last month, we've moved our 
uh, literacy to tariff for um, school and corporate buildings to a green tariff, um, which is setting offsetting a significant amount of carbon, as you can see there. And we also have a, a big solar array planned on our new building at the depot. Uh, it's going to be the biggest we've ever installed. It's due to be installed uh, in the first half of next year, and it should power uh, or produce enough power equivalent to powering 29 homes. So that will be great when that's uh, on stream and we're really producing that electricity locally. And the third category of emissions, which is also the most difficult, really, uh, are what's known as consumption emissions. So these are the emissions that are in our uh, the goods and services that we buy. Uh, one of the biggest areas, of course, is food around globally, around a third of global emissions are associated with food um, production, consumption and disposal. Um, which is why you see the, the messaging obviously around eating less meat and, and less dairy and uh, obviously re reducing food waste in the first place is very important as well. Uh, they're also in the goods and services we buy, like, like the laptops and computers we're all uh, using at the moment. They all have emissions associated with extracting the raw materials, manufacturing them, transporting them across the world, and of course using them and disposing them as well. And uh, although these emissions are out of sight, uh, they shouldn't be out of mind because they they're associated with our, the demand that we're creating uh, and of course we have flights as well that's um a, a creative uh, piece of work from a, an artist who, who superimposed eight hours of uh, flights at one of Heathrow's uh, runways gives you a real sort of sense of just how much air traffic um is operating above above Heathrow and and you know it starts makes us start to think that really we should be trying just to look at essential air travel if we can to try and drive those emissions down. And this is a, a really useful piece of work we've just had commissioned and, uh, and just got, uh, which sort of brings this down to a little bit more of a human scale. Um, this looks at the whole picture, all of the emissions associated particularly with residents across London, and we've got the data now for Harrow as well. And when you distill it down, the, the highlight is, as it says at the top there, each average resident in Harrow is producing around 8.6 tonnes, 8.6 of those balloons every every year. And the, the, the key areas are um, transport, that's the single biggest use, including things like flights as well, uh, energy use uh, in our uh, homes, and the third biggest is, is our food uh, and what we're eating. And then you can see that the smaller elements are all related to the other, other parts of our, our consumption, uh, including uh, clothing, footwear, our eating out, things like that. Um, I think this could be useful actually to dig down a little bit more at, at a future session, uh, but we haven't got time today. So how, how can you get involved? Well, I'll, I'll post this up uh, afterwards in the chat so you've got the links. Uh, there's many ways you can you can get involved. Um, these are just a suggestion if you're if you're thinking about what you can do. One is to try and calculate your carbon footprint. Lots of tools out there. There's a link there to a tool called G G Gicky Zero, which is a good one. Um, you can start to think about your own electricity tariff, how you um, uh, purchase electricity, perhaps install solar panels. Um, there's a couple of, uh, of good options there for you, including London Power, which is a mayor's initiative to uh, where you can switch to a renewable tariff. And it's, it's also uh, benchmarked uh, again in terms of the pricing. So you're getting an affordable and 100% renewable uh, tariff. Uh, there's also a scheme that we participated this year uh, for the first time in the Solar Together London scheme, which is a group buying uh, scheme for solar panels. And uh, we put out about 20,000 letters across the borough. You may well have received one. And uh, we got about 1,500 residents reply uh, expressing their interest in that scheme. And I think next year it will go live again. We'll also participate then. And uh, it's in planning also to include battery storage and I think electric charging points for vehicles as well. So again, I'll post that link uh, if you're interested. Um, and uh, just generally, the Energy Saving Trust is a, is a good website if you want to uh, find out more about uh, what you can do in your home to save energy. And just thinking about what, what you eat. Um, I've been asked by our, our waste, my waste colleagues just to put the, the, the message out there that actually still a third of our waste in our residual bins is food. So everything we can do to maximise food recycling and, and use the, the bins that are provided. Uh, makes a big difference to um, carbon and also the cost to the taxpayer. And there's a link there to the BBC's climate food calculator, should you wish to uh, find out the impact of what, what you eat. I'll just end on this slide. Um, it's an old one, uh, but it makes me chuckle. Uh, I don't think anybody believes climate change is a hoax anymore, but 
it makes an important point. This isn't just about the carbon. Um, I have to remind myself, uh, thick talking carbon day in, day out, it's really about all the benefits that go with that. And um, moving to low carbon society and low carbon lifestyles has many of benefits range, ranging from uh, new forms of jobs, whether it's from retrofit or repair and reuse, obviously the links to health and well-being from reducing uh, transport emissions and ultimately also giving uh, a natural world space for it to recover and to continue to look after us. So um, uh, it is really a really positive um, move um, in many ways, um, disregarding the, the fact that we're, we're reducing carbon. This is ultimately potentially going to lead to better lead to better ways of living. So I'll hand back now to Councillor Henson um, and we can take any questions, of course, via the chat and I'll please to pick them up later. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That, that, uh, <clears throat> for the information you've given through, these slides will be available later on on the website. We can sort of so you can get access to all the links that Matt is talking about. But it's also this is just a sort of um, the tip of the iceberg, as they would say, about the work that has been undertaken and some of the um, things that are happening in Harrow. Um, but it's also setting out a plan of where we want to go next to move that agenda forwards. So talking about the future. Um, our next presentation is um, from Newton Farm Primary School, but in a recent poll um, reported that 80% of children say we, we don't listen about climate. I have visited a lot of schools across Harrow and I know they have a great understanding of the world they live in. They just want to say a say in it. So tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matt Bradley, who's the head teacher at Newton Farm Primary School, who is also joined by his excellent school's eco council. Um, over to you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm very pleased that we, we've got the children here tonight, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a rather late for some of them, so uh, please bear with them. Um, but we would like to talk a little bit about, about what we're doing at Newton Farm to, um, to develop children's understanding of sustainability and also maybe to help out with that a little bit as well. Um, many years ago, when the teachers were looking at the curriculum of the school, uh, we came to understand that there would be a number of different challenges that children would be facing in their future, one of which um, being uh, the digital aspect of their future, because obviously, um, as they are growing older and once they enter the world of work, they'll be expected to use digital technology on every single day. But another element of our curriculum that we thought we needed to make sure we were incorporating into everything that we do with the sustainability curriculum and the sustainability aspects, because obviously the world they are in and the future that they are inheriting, um, and so, some cases looks uh, looks very challenging from, from, a, from, a, uh, from, from an eco perspective. Uh, now, I think it's a lot more interesting to hear from the children than from me, but what I would like to do is that if you have questions uh, for us, I will try and field those at the end, so please don't hesitate to put them in. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the Eco Council and they can talk to you about all the different work that we do at Newton Farm to teach, uh, uh, to educate and to uh, support sustainability initiatives. Just double checking that that's that's all all working here. Um, Miss Burgess, I, I I can see the presentation. I'm just wondering if you're still there and able to hear me. Otherwise, I can take take over. Did you want to click through the um, presentation, Matt, and then I, I, I will I will do it. I think that's probably for, for the best. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Um, children, uh, I hope you're ready. I'm going to clip through. You just need to remember to unmute um, when, when you're speaking on the presentation. I'm just checking to make sure that everything's okay. I think the people doing the talking haven't unmuted yet. Daniel, um, can you start us off, please? I think you're the you're the first bit. You're the first one. I think I've spoken to Miss Burgess, and she's said for you to, to to make sure you're speaking if you can unmute daniel i can see your hand waving you, on, on the screen you need to unmute on the um, on the, um I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be the 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 first one to talk i'm supposed to be talking about the point that's what i'm supposed to be talking about i don't know i i, I don't know who's talking about the school's sustainability aims uh, okay. Oh, it says that Anika is talking about the sustainability aims. Miss Anika. <laughs> oh, you just need to un unmute Anika. Is it Anika? You just need to unmute. I must say, it's a very good graphic. <laughs> uh, it will all come together in a second, but just to so make sure that... Oh, here we go. The school has a, a, um, several sustainability aims, which are threaded into our school improvement plan and fundamental decision that we make as an organisation. These aims are to end sustainability throughout the curriculum, to ensure that hybrid blended learning supports sustainability, review school process to become more sustainable as an organization, for example, a paper freeze, digital communication and minimizing the use of paper in, cl in the classroom, promote principles of sustainability beyond the school in our local community and, things, and think about ways we, that we can widen our impact. In our school, we have been learning outside as part of Forest School. Forest School is where children learn how to do things in the wild. We have learned how to make fires, how to find out different, different directions like north, east, south, west, how to read maps and complete orienting activities. Most importantly, during forest school, we learn to be safe in the wild and we learn how to recycle any waste we could find in the woods. <coughs> Um, wait, let me just check. We are working on the pond, which is in our school. This pond was included in our forest school where we did pond dipping and discovered different insects. We are also trying to clean the pond with nets during forest school. We've had the pond for 10 years, and that is a little bit unhealthy. So this year, we will hopefully have the chance to clean it. The gardening of Richmond Club creating an insect shelter from recycled materials to give all the insects a safer home. We also designed it in a way which provides a safer habitat for small creatures like hedgehogs. They might be smaller than us, but they still deserve a happy home. 
The gardening enrichment club has also been involved in building a greenhouse from recycled plastic bottles. Unfortunately, this wasn't a success and it kept blowing over in the wind. So we needed to buy a greenhouse, but we tried. Part of being sustainable is understanding that we may try lots of things, but they might not always work. It's just important to try and make a difference. Chromebooks. At Newton Farm, we have one-to-one -one Chromebooks for years six, one to six. Reception and nursery have access to a small bank of old laptops that we recycle to make into Chromebooks. They also have iPads, as do the teachers, which also support with our learning and mean that many more tasks in school can be completed in a paper-free way. Our school uses Chromebooks to reduce how much paper we are using for lessons. If you look at the books of Newton Farm, they use as much of space as they need to try and use paper. Home learning has come a long way since taking books home. We try to make technology technology as obtainable as possible. We have used computers for home learning to use less paper and still do as much as work. We have also started posting homework online so it does not waste paper. Our Year 3 teacher is the leader of Sustainable Travelling. Each year group has a WOW monitor who keeps track of it, of if you walked, walk or drive by car to school. Our bar monitors encourage us to walk to school. In our school, we have a school street where children can walk and no cars are allowed to pass it. The children who go home alone or even come to school by themselves can feel safe. It is also lowering the amount of pollution in the air surrounding the school. As children walk to school, we celebrate different things like happy feet, healthy heart week. Another way in which the school has shown its commitment to sustain sustainability is to increase the days that Mrs. Shah, our art teacher, works with us. By working at our school for another day, she is able to run an art, lab, an art and DT project with every year, from, year group from year one to year six, based entirely around sustainability and reusing items that would otherwise have been thrown away. During autumn one, the year twos have created fruit bowls by recycling old magazines. I think you'll agree they look fantastic. Other projects have other projects planned for this year include mosaics using old tiles, decorating glass bottles, and upcycling furniture. Year 5 Gardening Project. Agriculture is vital at our school. A whole year is committed towards planting. We want to make a difference to our school and achieving that will help us achieve changing our world. Many people around the world are struggling to eat and agriculture helps them. Pollution destroys this chance. Year 5 is responsible for planting and watering the school garden which is just outside the key stage two building. This is how we grow the beautiful flowers. We also have a company that is going to plant trees in the school garden. It is called Trees for Cities. It is important for children to learn about gardening because they should know how the environment works and how it can help them. This morning, year five planted bulbs and the Eco Council will take this further by planting trees. Sustainable communication. The way we keep sustainable communication is by using Sims Parent and ParentPay. Another one of these apps is Classroom, where parents can see the work that we have done and all the work that we are doing. 
Sims Parent and Parent Pay are used for bookings, such as if we want hot dinners, we can go to Parent Pay and our parents transfer money. Sims Parents are used for letters or announcements. We never get any paper letters because we are an eco-friendly school and we want to save the environment. Sustainability throughout curriculum. In our years one to six, we have been learning about different but effective things about the world and what is happening to it, such as climate change constantly. Year ones and twos are learning about forestation, deforestation, and about the rainforest. Year fours are learning about water evaporation, which is like the recycling process. Year five and year six are learning about the climate change. Year fives are learning it specifically in Greece. Why is sustainability so important? We all joined the Eco Council because we wanted to pro protect the environment as much as we can, we possibly can. Imagine living in a life in the dirt and with unclean air. We wanted to make a the school a better place for su sustainable living. It even says that says that on our application forms. Here at Newton Farm, we all understand that sustainability is so important because this is one way we can improve the quality of living in the world. It is a difference we can all make. We need to build a better future. We signed up for the Eco Council as we wanted to improve the school and make a better environment. We want you to feel inspired and make a change too. Everyone can make small adjustments adjustments to the way they live in order to make a big difference. Together, we can make a world a better place for everyone. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. That's an excellent um, presentation and shows the determination of our younger generation sort of really pushing the climate change agenda. Um, actually, I particularly like the fruit bowls. I thought they were excellent. And reuse is a key part of our waste strategy. So um, I think people will be learning from this about what they can really do rather than just throwing it in the bins. Um, I'd, I would say uh, we've got a question and answer session at the end, but I do have one I would like to ask now. Um, as an elected representative, um, we listen to residents when designing and agreeing our policies. I just would like to ask you really as a school council, what do you think others in Harrow and all of us sort of politicians and grown-ups and everyone else can do to make Harrow more sustainable? Maybe if, if you have a think about that now, children, for a moment, so that question is what can everybody do in Harrow to make things more sustainable? If mm. you've got an answer, just pop your hand on your head and we'll, we'll, we'll pick you to, to, to ask your question or to say your idea. Okay. You're all thinking. <laughs> oh, the teacher is. Oh, we've, we've, we've got one there. Uh, Daniel, you have your hand up. Do you want to say what you think we can do? Um, we, we can encourage Harrow and, and everyone in Harrow to be more sustainable by, by, by the stop littering. Littering, okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> proper disposal of waste. That's an excellent um, comment. Does anybody else want to contribute? And don't forget, this is opportunity that you don't often have, right? So I think um, uh, if you've got something you'd like to say, and you've got the leader of the council and many councils, many important people in here, now's your chance. No, that's okay, because I think you know, there's so many ideas that have come through oh, on the sure. presentation. There's things we should be taking forward as a council as well. And, and it's how we tell that story. Or oh, we have a hand, hand up from Varsha. On the top there. What's it called? Varsha, go ahead. Um, I want to expand on Daniel's point. Uh, littering has also uh, caused many, uh, I suggest that littering should be banned because some people, they don't follow the rules. Uh, by they they read the paper of not littering and then they'll litter again. So that is also affecting other people's um uh, body. 
So I think I think what you're saying is stricter enforcement of, of littering rules. Is that is that right? Yeah. Well, you, you'll be pleased to, um, to know that we have in, we have introduced fines for people caught um, littering, and team do go out and actually find quite a few people, take all their pocket money off them. But um, but you know, in a sense, but it's a really important point that you know you can educate people so far, and at the end of it all, you do need that consequence of um, a financial consequence, and I think that's going to come through some of the other presentations. I'd like to thank you for um, your time this evening and coming along. Um, you know, as I said right at the beginning, it's, it's your future that we're talking about. So we want to hear your views as well. I think everyone's view is very important if we're going to meet the climate change agenda in 2030 or even the key agenda times of 2050. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, we now move on to... Um, Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry um, Councillor. Um, can I just say, children, <clears throat> obviously it's getting late now and I wouldn't want you to stay up too late and this might be quite a lot longer, this meeting. I think, um, uh, children, if you if you need to go, then then, then uh, please do. But you're also, I'm sure, welcome to stay as well. Yes, and I also say thank you for looking after our park at Newton Park West. You know, that, that's a major sort of improvement around the environment and it's got a huge bugger hotel, so keep them all happy. Excellent. So if we just, um, and as a council, I think funding has always been an issue to launch large projects. And the one we're going to talk about next is, is no different. A lot of hard work has gone into developing these schemes, which start as flood alleviation schemes and end up as a series of joined up projects at the site. So we've got um, for, for the for Headstone Manor Park, we talk about things like the new wetland areas, the big ponds, the orchards, the playgrounds, the Edinburgh, and, a, and also the flood alleviation scheme, which all contribute towards providing, providing vital lessons on the climate change emergency. The new ecosystems at the park um, is also benefiting wildlife and providing a fantastic resource for visitors to see nature close up and become more conscious of how our actions impact the natural world. To tell us more of the exciting work being undertaken and future projects being developed across the borough, I would like to introduce um, Vicky Duxbury and Ollie Black, who are from uh, Thames 21. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Oh, sorry, okay. Hen Councillor Henderson. Sorry about that. <laughs> right. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. And uh, right. Um, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so thanks very much, everyone. Um, so just to introduce um, Thames 21, uh, we are a Rivers Trust and um, we we are a charity that works with the community, works with local authorities, works with other partners, and we we focus on improving rivers, waterways through, say, working with the community, through uh, monitoring, through training, through getting people involved and thinking about all the issues, some of which we've talked about already, such as littering, such as flooding. So, so we are a charity. Um, so why are we working in Harrow? So Harrow has a lot of waterways, as a often quoted figure um, from, um, from Nick and Tony, who are in the infrastructure team, that to tell me 80 kilometers of waterways in Harrow. So it's a lot of waterways, that be that a, a, small, uh, a small drain, it might be a stream. We don't have many significant rivers, but we do have the, what we call the catchments of rivers. So that's um, water feeding into the Thames, and through the River Crane, the River Brent, uh, through small, lots of small streams, the Edgeware Brook, uh, the Silk Stream, the Edding Brook. So lots of streams. And also those go through green spaces in Harrow. So you may have a stream very near you, but you may not be able to see it because there's a lot of hidden waterways in Harrow across London. There's a lot of completely hidden rivers. They go under, underground quite frequently. So why, why is, what are these issues to do with rivers? Uh, and what's the effect of climate change on rivers? Well, there's more extreme weather, as we've seen, uh, a lot more sudden showers, long periods of very wet weather. We've had that um, at the project. So I'm sorry, I just realized I haven't, didn't give myself a very good introduction. So my role is outdoor learning officer as part of the, 
Parks for People project at Headstone Manor Park. Um, so that's that's the way that uh, our charity is working with Harrow Council. Apologies for that, didn't introduce myself very well. Um, so we, and we've had quite a lot of weather delays at that site in particular with a um, very, very wet site. So long periods of, of wet weather and dry weather, so very extreme weather an increase in urbanisation, so lots more building, loss of green space in the borough because, because of development. So more hard surfaces, water um, rushes, rushes across these hard surfaces and down into the rivers and, they, and the drains and they just, just can't cope. Um, as also with periods of very dry weather, the water, the, the ground goes rock hard like concrete and then water can't penetrate that easily and it just runs off when there is um, heavy rain. As an example there of some flooding in Harrow and so it affects homes and businesses, it affects um, so businesses sites like Headstone Manor itself, so there's a granary building on the right. Um, it's an inconvenience, it's very costly and there is a risk to life and wildlife as well of flooding. So there's also um, periods in dry, there's, there's more periods of dry weather. So pollution, which is still very much a problem that shouldn't be entering our waterways, isn't getting flushed through. Not that we want it to be there at all, but it's just not getting, it sitting around for longer. There might be low flows due to this dry weather. So the water is sitting around more. Um, so it's not polluted, uh, sorry, it's not diluted um, and it stays around. So lit physical litter like the plastic at the bottom there, or it might be um, pollution um, as vis very visible pollution like the sewage. Sometimes it's not visible at all, it's in invisible pollution. Another impact of climate change or that sort of change uh, changing weather patterns as well and and this is also just the effect of man's use of water is overuse of water um, and long periods of dry weather meaning that there's too much um, water being taken out of rivers what we call abstraction for manufacturing for producing all sorts of things like jeans that you wear for cars for housing development too much water being taken out and some water courses in some areas are drying up completely. So that has a big impact on wildlife. Um, also, it takes away the pleasure of being by a river. So it, it, it is a big problem. Um, we're all using too much water. So think about your water footprint. How much water are you using at home? But also how much are you using the things that you buy? So you could look at your water footprint. That's something we do look at with communities. And think about the water use in London alone is, is impacting on um, the chalk streams. We, we have 85% of the world's chalk streams in the UK, and these are being quite badly affected by over abstraction of water. So what can we do to address these issues? Well, we can green up the streets, so softening the landscape, putting more planting in along pavements, in our gardens as well. Instead of hard surfacing, we could have gravel or permeable uh, surfacing, surfacing that water can soak through, um, more planting. So just allowing more space for water to soak in rather than running off. There's lots of information available on the RHS website, for example, on planting schemes. And there's actually um, information produced by DEFRA on this because it is a real issue of hard surfacing. So addressing these issues, um, developers like Persim and Homes and Barrett do have to build in sustainable urban drainage. This is on the old Kodak site, and this is what they call an attenuation pond. It's wet during the winter time, possibly during the summer, but it's a seasonal pond to hold water. So this is um, something that we're seeing more and more of. So going on to Headstone Manor Park, what have we done there to um, address these issues? So the issues at Headstone Manor Park have been pollution from misconnection, water 
um, that's water that's coming into the rivers that shouldn't be, it should be going into the sewage from homes, from businesses, um, water running off roads, it's got chemicals in it, toxins in it, it's, get, it's getting into the Yedding Brook, which runs into Hesdon Manor Park and into the moat, which you can see there, and then on into the River Crane and into the River Thames, so we're sending pollution downstream. And also flooding as well has been a problem um, around, around the Headstone area. So the council applied for funding from the lottery and also from the GLA, the Mayor of London funding, um, to, to bring in some funding to um, address these issues. I'm just going to show you a short film um, of what's been going on at Headstone. Apologies if there's no sound on this, I've had some technical issues, but there are some subtitles. Um, so I'll, I'll, I will show you that in a second. Right. So this does give a um, overview of the the wetland that has been created at Headstone Manor Park. Um, so the Yedding Brook feeds into, now it's into two, these sedimentation ponds, which drops silt and then goes through the reed bed, which is just beyond the bridge there. And it's a place to, to attract lots of wildlife. Um, it will attract lots of wildlife, it is doing already. Um, and it's dealing with the pollution that's coming into the water through the action of um, the enzymes on the plant roots. So it's cleaning the pollution and then taking it, take, allowing clear water to go into the moat. So also being created at Headstone is um, a large flood attenuation area, some flood basins, which are there to take excess water that's coming through from Yedding Brook in times of heavy water. It's what we call a flashy river. Um, it can all of a sudden get quite full and the amount of water is sort of backing up and flooding, flooding places. So this is showing the, um, the opening of the official opening of the park. Um, I say, I do apologize that uh, there's no um, sound on here. Um, subtitles as well have gone off. Sorry about that, having a few technical issues here. Um, so the, the, um, the flood basins at the park are also creating a habitat. I'm going to show you a couple more pictures of that here, some images here of the flood basins. It's a large area of the park um, that's been used up for this, but it's a very important way of controlling flooding uh, and dealing with pollution. And there, there's a lovely overview of the wetland area park. So let's get back to my slides. Apologies. So I do apologize for that uh, slideshow, which was, there was uh, no sound on. So just to show you, show you a few more slides um, here of, um, of the park. So we have a the new overflow car park, which we call a, a sustainable urban drainage area. So the water can penetrate into the um, into the grid underneath it, what looks like grass is actually a car park underneath. So the flood basin itself is um, is next to the new. Um, Apologies, that's my timer. Um, next to um, the playing fields, which have had new drainage put in. Um, so this area on the right, the flood basin will have, um, will be managed um, for wildlife, but it's there to, have, to take excess water to stop homes flooding further downstream. The Yedding Brook was previously in a tunnel on, on um, and it, that's been opened up to allow more daylight in. Um, and it's been it, it's now allowed to expand. It's been put back into meanders, and it's now got space. As as you can see on the right, it's got space to expand if it needs to. So the area is more like the flood meadow that it used to be um, in past times. 
So we've worked very much with the community in creating this, uh, these new spaces at the park. Um, so the vo volunteers in the middle there are doing some reed planting. The volunteers on the right doing some hedge planting. So tree planting is a very important part of helping to control flooding. Um, and on the left there, we've got some volunteers undertaking some training, uh, learning about waterways and how you manage them. Um, so lots of community engagement at Headstone Manor Park through corporate days, getting volunteers in, children playing in uh, or in the stream, wild play, encouraging people to appreciate their space, um, going on walks, talking about rivers and storytelling, and just general community engagement, just telling people about the issues that rivers face. We're developing an education pack so that schools can visit the park and learn about what's living in the river and why that's, uh, why that's important. And sustainability, we're training the volunteers um, so that they can help to manage the spaces in the park in the future, um, learning about what's living in the, park, in the, in the water. So just to mention is to talk about lessons learned, we, we're, as we've been working with Harrow Council for several years and a couple of exam examples there of some projects where as, as the years have gone, we've been working, say, with, with the council, we've we sort of in, improved the projects and, and developed more sort of a bio, biodiversity approach to naturalise the spaces. So we've got left on the left there, Newton Park, which was a large scheme put some wetland areas in to control flooding. And on the right, um, sort of Whitchurch playing fields. And then on the left here, Stanmore Marsh, um, which was a deculverting and taking the stream out of the tunnel to open it up and allow daylight in. And some, um, some planting at Queensbury Recreation Ground. So very much involving the community in dealing with um, flooding. And then Bentley Priory, which is a site, um, a very important site for nature in Harrow, we've been doing some natural flood management. So that's um, putting in some, something called leaky dams to, to slow the flow of water and stop it all rushing downstream. And the young lady on the right is monitoring the leaky dam with an, a, an app. So we're using monitoring uh, and informing future projects. So I say, say it, uh, Headstone Manor, it's all been about creating a wetland area, working with the community, the, count, the council uh, project there. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Ollie, who's going to tell you about a new project, which is a very big project, which Harrow and Thames 21 are working together with Brent Council. Yeah, thank you very much, Vicky. Um, so yeah, so I'm, my name's Ollie Back. Um, I'm the engagement officer on this uh, new project. Um, and as you can see here, it's, sort of, um, it's been mentioned a few times tonight, actually, that the idea of partnerships is really important, that everyone is working together. Uh, and that's like a really core cool part of um, this project. So it's called the Silkstream Flood Resilience Innovation Project. Um, so resilience is a term that we use um, becoming much more common. We know that we're going to get more rainfall. We know that there'll be more water in the future with climate change. How can we be resilient to that? So when the water comes, you know, how do we deal with it? Um, so yeah, if we move on to the next slide. Um, so it's basically the kind of principle behind it is using nature-based methods to improve flood resilience in the silk stream catchment. So it's a partnership project. So it's led by Harrow and Barnet councils and will run for six years, which is a really exciting opportunity to sort of do quite long form planning and sort of um, long form community engagement actually which is something that sort of often is um, is lacking is that, that, that time that you get to work with people. Um, it's one of 25 related schemes across England so it's this flood and coastal resilience innovation initi initiative which is all about innovative new ways of improving resilience um, and that's what we're, we're about to do. Um, so next slide. Um, so yeah, so just in terms of silk stream, that sort of might be kind of an abstract term for some people on the call. You might be a bit more, uh, a bit more familiar of what that what that is. Um, the silk stream it runs through both um, Harrow and Barnet, uh, as well as a little bit of Brent. Um, so you can see here on this map, this is the catchment. So the catchment, um, which I think Vicky referred to, was essentially, you know, the area where all the rain lands on the earth will collect into these rivers and streams. 
and flow downstream, uh, eventually into the River Brent and eventually into the River Thames and then out into the sea. Um, so the dotted lines here indicate the borough boundaries. Um, so you can start to see, get a real picture of why it's important to, to, for boroughs to work together and for multiple partners to work across boundaries because you know, the environment is shared, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't move particularly along these lines that, that we've created uh, in a sense. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll sort of talk very briefly about two kind of core concepts. And um, we're right at the start of this project, so um, a lot of a lot of what we're doing is is still unknown at the moment. Um, but natural flood management is kind of at the core of it all. Um, so it's using natural processes to reduce flooding. Um, the old the old way of building a big concrete wall and building it higher and higher and higher. Um, we're starting to realise that, that that's not going to work. Um, and actually, natural flood management um, means there's multiple benefits. Um, so you see seeing this sort of stuff at Headstone where you've got wetlands, trees and vegetation, they can slow how quickly water moves through the landscape. Um, and there are loads of other benefits that come with this as well. So um, vegetation is really good at filtering out pollutants. Um, so you get reduced pollution in rivers. Um, it's often less carbon intensive. Building a big concrete walls is, is highly en high engineering. It takes a lot of carbon to do so. We're increasing more habitat for wildlife. And often greening up areas um, brings a whole number of social benefits. So you see that at Headstone Manor where um, you've got these kind of nice areas to sort of walk through and, and to enjoy. And we, you know, more and more we're, we're starting to realise the benefit and the importance of getting out in green spaces um, on our wellbeing. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so these, I've got a couple of diagrams here. So obviously we're at the sort of planning stage of our project. Um, so these are kind of more indicative, but this kind of gives you a real good example of um, what we mean by this concept of slow the flow. So Vicky mentioned this uh, in the Headstone project. Um, when water hits the ground, um, often if it's hitting impermeable surfaces, it will go straight off your roof into a drain, into the sort of um, system and then straight into the river. Um, and that process is really quick. Um, so you can see here, you know, we've got a diagram of um, kind of rain hitting the ground. And on the way you can see on the road, it's picking up bits of oil slick pollutants. And that sometimes, depending on the systems that we've got, will go straight into the river. A lot of, um, a lot of drains that you see on the road are actually con directly connected to the local river. And um, so often we think, oh, we'll just chuck whatever we want. Actually, that's going straight down the drain and it's straight into your local river. Um, so it takes pollutants with it. So next slide, please, Vicky. Um, so here's an example of um, what we like to see at Thames 21 um, and includes sustainable urban drainage systems, uh, as well as wetlands and ponds and bits and pieces. You start to see that actually when the rain falls, you know, it hits the ground, but actually it sort of gets collected much quicker. So we've got these little pockets of sort of drainage area. Um, rain gardens, places like that. And again, that filters out the pollutants, so it's not going straight into the river system. Um, so vegetation is really good at that, good at filtering stuff out like that. And so you can see we've got much more wildlife. Um, you tend to get greener spaces and you get a lot of social benefits that come with that. Um, so next slide, please. So um, another sort of, uh, the kind of other term that I'm gonna talk about, which is really at the core of this project is this concept of co-design. Um, so more and more we're realising that the, the environment and the parks and the sort of green and blue spaces that we have are shared amongst us all. So they're, you know, they're part of the community, you know, no one person owns it. And so actually that's really important that everyone has a say on it. So co-design in this project, it really important, it's really important to have community input. So residents will be able to have their say on the design of projects. So right now we don't know what we'll design. We sort of know where the rivers are. We know where the parks are. We know where the opportunities might be but we don't know specifically what we're gonna do. Would it be worth putting a pond in an area? It, it's kind of up to a conversation with the community, with the residents. Actually, right now we have a catchment wide survey, which is closing tomorrow. I'll share a link within the chat. And this is a really, really important uh, way of us gathering information. It gives us a baseline to base everything off of that we can kind of get a gauge what the community wants, what you know already about flood resilience uh, and what kind of suggestions you've got. Um, so yeah, I'll share, I'll share a link in the chat. So if anyone's got a chance, it closes at midnight tomorrow. Um, that's a really important survey for us to gather. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, and on this as well, we have a launch event tomorrow. Um, so that's in Montrose Playing Fields. Um, so it's 10.30 and um, we'll be gathering. Um, it's kind of a sort of starter pistol for the project. Um, we're in our very early stages of what is, you know, going to be six years ahead of various different interventions across the catchment. Um, so yeah, if you can't make this, there'll be plenty of opportunities in the future to sort of get involved. Um, if you want to do practical things in terms of practically improving your environment, or if you want to kind of 
have a say of the design of what we might do in a park. So where a pond might go, where we might put benches, things like that. Um, there'll be multiple different opportunities and there'll be other stuff as well, like activities and sort of ways to sort of learn a bit more about the event. So here is an opportunity to come down. You can talk to the project team about what we're kind of thinking and what, where we might be starting sort of to look at. Uh, but don't worry if you can't make it. Um, I'll send a, again, in the, I'll put a link in the chat to sort of join our mailing list and find out a little bit more. Um, so I think that's all my slides. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for listening. Um, so there's an email there if you want to do, if you do want to get in touch. Uh, and I think there'll be, um, yeah, we'll be moving on to a Q&A now. Is that right? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Vicky and Ollie. We've got one more presentation, short presentation, but then we go to the Q&A session. Um, just for the Q&A, um, on the panel this evening, we do have two senior en engineers from um, Harrow Council, um, Tony Tonetti and Michael Bradshaw has been heavily involved with a lot of these projects. Now, um, when we start off, you start off with a lot of smaller projects around flood alleviation, you turn them into these big schemes, and there's a lot of work involved in that. So if you've got any technical questions, I would defer to them to answer because um, it can be quite complicated. And we're talking about fluvial rates. We also have um, Rebecca Johnson, the senior officer around our waste service, uh, who's you know, environmental services here as well. So um, it's really a plug for if you've got any questions, put them in the in the um, Q and A bit box now, and we'll try and get to some of those. And also um, thanking um, <clears throat> Vicky and Ollie for, for the presentation. Um, I would say that if you get an opportunity to go and look at some of these sites, you know, when people um, go to them now, they don't recognize them from what they were like a couple of years ago. Newton Farm Park, which is next to Newton Farm School, um, a few years ago was a quagmire at this time of year. You know, it was clay and um, very little used. If you go there now, the residents will tell you how well it's used, but it's also cleaning out the water, filtering it all out. The wildlife is unbelievable. And I still say we've got the biggest bug hotel I've ever seen in my life, and you know, it's huge, but it's really bringing those benefits back to the environment and it's worth going to see. And the work at Headstone Manor, um, even if it's raining, it's worth walking around. You can always stop in the cafe and get a cup of coffee afterwards. So it's a good plug for that one as well. So. Um, we, as I say, we do have one final um, presentation um, this evening, and it's one of our from one of our many community groups in Harrow. And I'd like to introduce Simon Joshua, who's here tonight to tell us all about the entries to the competition earlier um, this year that was designed to raise awareness about biodiversity and environment in Harrow. So over to you, Simon. Um, okay, I just want to give a brief overview um, of the competition um, that was run um, from the end of last year until until this year, it's just recently closed. Um, we put uh, the name to a poll on, on Facebook and the, and the name Harrogo Green was chosen by the majority of people. Um, it was an idea that originally came from um, one of the councillors, Sue Anderson. And it was discussed within the council and a number of other organizations um, to support uh, running it. Um, I started a, um, a social media platform, um, which was called Harrow Biodiversity and Environment. It's, it's just really a um, a facility for people to discuss, um, learn about environmental issues, particularly pertaining to what's going on in, in Harrow. Um, I'm currently also a ranger for London National Park City and working for My Yard, which is well known for its um, work with um, food, um, reducing food waste and reducing um, food poverty. Um, but we're getting involved with um, developing and restoring community gardens, um, working with people living in uh, social housing, particularly on estates, and giving them an op opportunity to grow um, their own plants, fruit and, um, sorry, fruit, vegetable and, and flowers. Um, so we, dis we, we began the competition um, at the end of last year. Um, the 
pandemic obviously had a huge impact on on how we were able to promote it but um, the whole competition was actually held um, online uh, there were no visits from from judges etc um, but it also gave us a huge opportunity to present some um, interesting workshops give people ideas about what they can do um, in their own schools in their in their gardens etc um, and it also brought together a, a large number of individuals and environmental groups um, in Harrow, um, as well as local businesses and, and of course, the council. Um, so we settled on a, a limited number of categories for the first year. This is obviously the first year that this, this competition has been run. Um, more than um, half of the categories involve young people and I think you can see from the, pre the fantastic presentation from Newton um, there's a, a huge amount of knowledge um, uh, within schools and, and young people and we actually had some stunning um, entries both from individuals and also from schools. Um, we also included a category for front gardens that's obviously that's been highlighted a couple of times today. Um, it's a really important um, feature to reduce flooding, that they're designed properly or that they follow the rules. Um, also, a garden, uh, best garden managed for nature, and then also a uh, most original idea to enhance biodiversity. Um, there are a number of videos etc on youtube on the on the youtube channel um there's also a facebook group um and there's also a, a twitter feed um as well as the website so if you want to follow up on um how the competition ran and all the winners and highly commended entries um those are all on the website so we wanted to involve a number of businesses and look at areas where um, people can make a difference um, we're not talking about huge projects, diverting course of rivers, et cetera. We're talking about people's gardens, um, people's schools, um, what you can do yourself. And in order to address the issue of biodiversity loss, which is closely linked to um, the climate uh, crisis, we all need to do our bit. The vast majority of people need to do their bit. If you have a garden, you need to um, think about how that's designed. Um, and one of the the major things is, is looking at perma, permaculture, um, reducing the use of peat, for example. So we um, went to Melcourt, who are one of the UK's leading supplier of um, peat-free compost, um, and they did a, a fantastic presentation on how peat-free compost is, is produced, um, also why that's such a major issue. And um, you can see the recording of that presentation on, on YouTube. Um, another really interesting area was how um, we're planting green spaces. Um, we hear a lot about tree planting. Tree planting is not the issue, um, the major issue for, for um, solving the cl climate crisis. Um, we need to look at other management techniques. And, and one of the most exciting ones that I saw a presentation of um, only last year was um, from the Wood, Wood Meadows Trust. This is where you combine tree planting with um, the benefits of a wildflower meadow and the biodiversity is off the scale in, in this kind type of management. Um, it's something you can do on a small scale um, and it's actually something that's happening now in Harrow. The, the first wood meadow in London is being developed um, by a number of people including Simon Braidman in Pinner. Um, we often hear about green roofs, but you can do this on a small scale. So cycle shelters, bin stores, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a manufacturer of, of these systems. Um, they're delivered in one piece. Um, and there's a variety of ways that you can plant the top. Um, it's great for pollinators. It's, it looks good, but it also reduces um, flood risk because that green roof is actually holding water rainwater so particularly in an urban environment which of course harrow is we need to be looking at, at these kinds of things as well 
Um, there's also a presentation by Green Roof Shelters, um, and that's on the YouTube channel. Um, our, our biggest um, audience <laughs> for presentations was actually by, um, uh, for a presentation by Caesar Visley, which is um, a company that's based in Harrow, um, and it's one of the foremost suppliers of heritage variety seeds, um, flowers, as well as plants. Um, the presentation looked at how we um, grow our own fruit and vegetable, but also how we cook it and how we use it and how we reduce waste, how we maybe look at going back to seasonal um, produce. And again, that's that's something that you can see online. It's on the on the YouTube channel. Um, another sponsor who donated um, this particular daffodil bulb, it's called Dutch Master, um, is Jacques Armand, also in, in Harrow Weald. Um, what, we uh, what we wanted to do was promote um, the purchase of things like bulbs and seeds from local businesses, and um, Jacques Armand can supply uh, native um, daffodils, for example, which you can plant up in, in road verges. Um, we worked with a couple of other uh, organizations like Harrow and Leaf, who manage the allotments in Harrow. It's a really important area for um, to look at soil health. Um, also, the conservation volunteers, Harrow Heritage Trust, and um, a couple of businesses like garden design companies. Um, Harrow Nature Conservation Forum ran a series of workshops, um, which highlighted areas that um, we've mentioned this evening, but things that people can do in their own homes, in their gardens, and areas like schools, or, or even in businesses. Um, and I believe that summaries of those presentations are on their website. Um, we also often hear about rewilding. Um, a lot of people associate that um, with maybe untidiness or or unmanaged areas. It doesn't have to be. We can plant native species in our own gardens, and many of those are absolutely stunning. Um, so what we did when in one month was to feature a new um, native species of plant um, every day for a, for a whole month, and that um, was an A to Z series. That again is on on the website. Um, we were lucky enough to have some key judges. Um, one of them was Mark Lane, the TV garden designer. Um, and then we had councillors and MPs from, from both parties. Um, also a number of individuals like Kabir Cowell, who's another London National Park City Ranger, um, up and coming, probably a up and coming TV star. Um, I believe he's just turned 16, but he's a fantastic naturalist. Um, if you'd like to see details about the winning entries, they're all on the website, um, photographs and videos also on the, on the Facebook page. Um, I'm in the process of visiting as many as I can. Um, and I've got a few details of, of some of them. Um, Pinner, Pinnerwood School has a fantastic um, forest school project running at their site, um, rather like Newton. Um, we need to see these really in every single school. The, the, the future is obviously um, our younger generation. Um, and some of these children are so um, well educated about the issues of, of environment, probably a lot better than many adults in the, in the borough. Um, I also visited the garden of Edward Reed and his parents, and that's an absolutely stunning site, absolutely amazing. Um, there's so many ideas there. They have um, stag beetles breeding there. Um, and again, this is a young man. I think he's just nine years old. Um, and he knows so much about so many um, issues like developing um, wildflower meadows, about not cutting the lawn, um, native species, building bug hotels. And again, there's loads of photographs on the, on the website about his entry. 
Um, and then there was one entry on a an allotment. This is West Harrow allotments. Um, Semba has developed an area. She was given an area to um, rewild, if you like. Um, she's produced um, bug hotels. Um, she's recycling materials like these plastic bottles to, to create bird feeders. Um, and the the project isn't even a year old, and she's seen a huge amount of wildlife coming to visit. Um, she's got a fantastic little pond. Um, hopefully, she's going to see some amphibians in there next year breeding. So, um, why have this competition? Well, it's really just to highlight ideas that people can take home and and do themselves. Um, it's a great way of educating people. There's a little bit of um, competitiveness. Um, the council put up prize money for each winning entry. Um, if we take this forward into the next year, it would be nice to have prizes from other other organisations and, and businesses. Um, and really, it's just a matter for sharing ideas and, and seeing what can be done, quite simply. None of these were major projects. All of these were, were relatively simple and that pretty much anybody with a garden or anybody in the school can can carry out. Um, it would be nice to see more work being done with forest schools. That's certainly something we'd like as a charity in, uh, at my yard to, to, to promote. Um, but also with the younger generation, it's so important that they think about um, jobs, futures and careers in the environmental sector. This is something that the government is pushing. Um, I'm not sure how much of that is being developed in, in Harrow, but it, it needs to happen. It needs to happen quickly. Um, and obviously a competition like this is, is going to raise awareness about the importance of biodiversity, but also issues like um, permaculture, um, no dig gardening, for example, to maintain the soil health. Um, and we can feature some of these ideas in, in, in next year's competition. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. There's a lot of information in there, as, as I said, about going through the competition, but that's an example of one of the community groups that's working across Harrow to try and improve the diversity of our ecological survival, I suppose. And we now move into the um, question and answer session. And there is quite a few questions that have come through and it needs an expert really to sort of try and um, deal with, with, with a lot of the questions that are in there. Um, some of the ones that have come through, if, this, if any of the panellists have seen any that they would like to um, answer live now, some of them we will group together, um, but I can't see anyone indicating at the moment, but one of the things that's come through is how can we better connect with um, our environments and the part we haven't really touched upon at this moment is around our part user groups who do a lot of work in Harrow. We set them up in, um, two, someone correct me, it was 2015, um, coordinated them with a proper constitution and they have come on a long way since, since that time and we had a forum as well where they come together to percolate ideas and how we support that and we are looking at other parks to set some of that up. Um, it's, so it's how we can get better engagement with the part user groups is one of the questions. Um, there's also some questions in there about actually disposal of waste. We haven't really touched upon that tonight, but we can do in a future meeting about any other proper way to do it. Um, Rebecca's here, but the environment bill is going to work its way through uh, into legislation. In a couple of years time, we're going to have to divide our waste up more. So it's how we do that. And the reasons why, you know, where we put our street waste bins is another question that's also coming through. And the and there's another one, the final one, really. There's a number, there's a few questions that have come through asking, you know, we had this um, presentation a couple of years ago now, um, and we've been quiet ever since. And I, and I think that's mainly is still done due to COVID. Everyone was pulled off to do um, other work, although the environment work was still continuing. I think people worked around the clock to make sure it, it could happen. It's just that our focus had to be with the response to COVID itself. So, um, 
Yeah, so there has been a slight delay and we want to pick some of that up. So the purpose of tonight is following on from the COP26 is to show some of the work. And I'm saying it's only a small part of it of what's happening across Harrow and how people can really get involved to take this agenda forward. Um, Matthew is going to update the website. It is, it has been updated, but not with pictures yet. But we will be updating the website to show all the work that's coming on and, and how people can get involved, and especially the things like the... Um, the Silkstream project that's going live at the moment um, is an important one, you know, because that's a six year project, but that's going to filter out exactly like around Headstone Manor. But we want people to be involved in the parks to make sure we maintain them going forward. You know, there's a willing group of volunteers, we do need um, that response. So there is a, a poll just been launched um, to ask people about what they would like to come up. And um, if you could select three out of the, out of the six that are there, two, five that are there. Um, about what we should move into. Uh, um, the one I was speaking about was the recycling consumer that bit talking about waste disposal. If I just quickly ask, is there any of the panel members want to, after hearing what's been said and reading the questions that have come through, if they wanted to pick anything out that they would like to respond to at this moment in time? I've got one for Matthew at the Newton Farm Eco Council. <laughs> um, um, I understand there's a a lot of our schools do have eco councils and we asked you tonight um and Pinus high school um just recently won a mayor's um award for the work they're doing around ecology and everything i just wonder from your experience of how you could encourage um more involvement because they've got some great ideas the younger generation it's just how we can encourage them to come forward and sort of um, present like they did tonight yes um i i think most schools you'd find have certainly got sustainability within their sites and of course i guess much like the council sometimes other things will will take a priority and my view is the next step for schools and the local authority is to form some kind of a committee of 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 engaged schools and allow it to spread that way i i believe that probably every school is doing some sustainability work but there's not a lot of communication uh, I, I feel about what's happening and how we can work together to, to, to support this. I mean, the children, as you've seen, are very passionate and they absolutely can drive a lot of this work forward and, and bring it to their families and spread the education that way. Um, so I do think there are a lot of opportunities for that. It's really just finding ways to, to, to get, uh, you know, head teachers or other senior leaders from within schools who, who are motivated together and, and starting that off. And of course, within schools and with the school environment is that once somebody is doing it and doing it well and the educational benefit becomes apparent, then everybody wants to pick it up. Excellent. And um, Varsha, Varsha Parliament here, councillor is, is cabinet member for, for this area, but we also have councillor Butterworth who's also a teacher. So we're looking at how we can sort of bring the schools into sort of a projects and program because there's a lot of um, skillful people you know experienced people around the environment here who might be able to assist so you know how to ask what we can do because sometimes a small ask doesn't take um much to deliver and i think that's a good a point uh, varsha Thank you, Graham. Just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, the fantastic work that everyone's been doing in the schools is so encouraging. And I've always said, um, and Sarah will say the same, that um, the schools have a, an immense part to play in, in all of this. And I've worked in schools before. Um, and, you know, the younger generation have a lot of fantastic ideas, but they are also a, are, are ambassadors, as far as I'm concerned in putting these ideas forward um, and you know I agree that you know they are our future and they we can start in schools to getting our messages out and I know many schools have approached me uh, regarding recycling and how they can you know put that forward uh, with their children in assemblies etc um, so you know I'm really really uh, sort of proud that our schools are really doing their part and there's so much we can still do and as you heard uh, tonight about the different projects that we are doing with the council and with our other partners. Um, and I said earlier that it is for all of us to work together collaboratively, collectively own it because it is our uh, planet. We all live in it. We all enjoy the beautiful things that it has to offer, um, you know, and unfortunately, we've been a bit greedy and, and utilized more than we should have. And now it's time to put that back in and, you know, start um, giving back 
to mother nature what it's given us for you know all this time and you know that there are so many different ways we can uh, work together and you know i would like people to um, come through to myself to graham or to sarah and give us your ideas and and we're open to those sort of um, things as well and you know for anyone any one of our participants you know and i really thank you tonight for you know taking the time out to be with us and sharing um you know our ideas hearing what we can do you know there is still a lot going on in the background obviously we can't tell you everything tonight but you know we hope that we'll do another one and obviously with the poll um just closing i think we'll know what sort of um, people are interested in but you know if we haven't done something tonight please do drop us a line and tell us what your interest is because there are so many different things uh, that are involved in this and you know if people have followed the um, conference, they will know that it's not, you know, a few little bits, but there are lots of things that we can get involved in. And like I said earlier in my uh, little speech, that we can all participate, we can all be part of this journey. And I think to, together we can make that big difference. And, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about this and I know we all can do that. So thank you, Lida, and thank you everyone for what you are doing at the moment. And I look forward to hearing so much more of what else we are going to do together. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Varsha. So in drawing um, this particular meeting to a close, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who's um, come along tonight, but it's shown there is an interest across Harrow. Um, we, we've got some ideas about what we want to do going forwards on some of those. And I think Matthew can probably articulate that in a, in a minute. Um, he's just thinking about what our next steps will be and how we can do things. Um, Tony and Michael here haven't said, and Rebecca, so I didn't see Rebecca here, didn't know if we've got any um, technical questions, but some of the things that are coming through is we are looking at re-greening you know, our road space, putting the, um, the spaces back in, the grass verges back in where possible. Um, but it, it, a lot of this comes down to funding. So we do bid into a lot of external funding to deliver a lot of this. We've been very good at it, um, which is an important part. We also have quite a few um, significant number of trees going in. Um, you know, you need specific um, species on, on the high road because of the roots and damage they can cause underground. So there's a lot of things going on. And I think we can move forward in confidence to say, you know, we keep you in, engaged and informed how to do it. One of the questions that come through is how people want to be kept informed. We can do a um, part that we can do an update through the My Harrow newsletter, but we can also probably, if um, we can explore um, a newsletter about environment that goes out to people who can sign up to it about being engaged. We look, the poll results are sort of coming back talking about waste. And I would include food waste in this. You know, when we started off the food waste collection, we were collecting over 160 um, tons of um, food waste a week at one time. And now it's down to about 150 as people become more aware of you know, what they're buying and what they're disposing. So that's very, um, very good points. Um, so we've got some final words to be said. Um, we've got Tony, Tony Tonetti. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor. Just a very quick one. There was a question uh, on the chat regarding tree watering and the, the loss of newly planted trees. Um, just to clarify the situation with that, the, the contractor is required to replace any trees that die in the first two years. Obviously, we'd like them to survive and not to not to um, not to die, so that they will have to replace any that that uh, die. Uh, we do audit every every year the uh, the planting that goes in, so we do ensure that every, any trees that fail uh, do get um, do get replaced. Uh, this year we're we're quite um, we're, we're doing quite well with the the, the program. We're we're um, we're planning to plant approximately six hundred trees, which is more or less double uh, our annual um, tree total. So that's thanks to some uh, external funding that we've uh, been successful with. So um, we're catching up uh, on the number of uh, street trees um, that we've that we've lost over the years due to the various uh, causes. So um, the the tree situation is improving in Harrow and um, long may it continue. Excellent, thank you, Tony. Um, unless anyone else has any final comments, I'll, I'll say we have, uh, thank you all for coming along. We will work out our next steps. Dipti's here taking a lot of notes with Rebecca and Matthew um, to work out you know, how we can prioritise this going forwards. It is an eight year journey, but we want to get as much done in the first few years to make it a bit easier to sort of take the longer term view. Um, 
and we work out how we can involve people in doing that. Uh, um, we can't do these things on our own. You know, we learned a lot um, through, you know, through the last couple of years that we work better when we're working together and get things through in, in that way. And you know, there's a lot of things we can do. We just need um, people to help as well along the way. So thank you very much for your time and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.